Welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. My name is Professor Leah West. I'm an assistant professor at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs. I'm very pleased to have so many of you join us today. I'm going to uh, invite our Dean, Brenda uh, O'Neill, to pre prevent, present some opening remarks before we get underway with um, the presentation of research today. Thanks very much, Professor West. And I want to thank you and your team for all the hard work in bringing this event together today. Uh, welcome to everyone who's joining us this afternoon. And before we begin, I would like to just take a moment to acknowledge that Carleton University is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. And although we might be attending from different events, I think it nevertheless remains important to recognize the traditional indigenous lands on which we reside and to do so with intention. So today we're gonna to learn more about the role of Canada's intelligence and national security community in global welfare emergencies. So national security threats have certainly not ceased during the pandemic. And indeed the rapid trans transmission of disease in a globalized world brings with it a, a host of security concerns. I mean, we've seen an increase in violence, cyber attacks and disinformation and of utmost importance is maintaining national security while respecting legal obligations and the privacy to some extent of Canadians. So there's no question that these are key issues of great importance that you'll be discussing today. Thank you to all the presenters, uh, NIPSIA faculty members, NIPSIA students, as well as NIPSIA students from the Infrastructure Protection and International Security Program. All of this research and all of your research is important and integral to the mission of the Faculty of Public Affairs, which is to help build better societies and stronger democracies and to address regional and global challenges and to enhance and inform public discussion. So there's no, uh, no need to listen too much more to me. This event is part of the FPA research series, an ongoing celebration of the diversity of research produced in the Faculty of Public Affairs. You can always go to the uh, FPA website at carlton.ca slash FPA slash events to learn more. So I look forward to hearing, uh, hearing from uh, the panelists today. And uh, back to you, Leah. Thank you so much, Dean O'Neill. So before we begin, I, I must say that this research is, uh, has been funded by uh, SHRC through a uh, partnership engagement grant. Our partner in this work was the Intelligence Assessment Secretariat with the Privy Council Office. We also received funding from MINE through a targeted engagement grant with the Department of National Defense to fund our research to ensure that it'll be open um, and accessible and published open access. So we have to thank both of our funders um, for allowing us the opportunity to engage in this research. Bef um, before we move on, I'll just explain to everyone the format for today. Rather than have everyone present and then do Q&A at the end, we're hoping to make this a little bit more engaging. We're going to have each presenter present for a short period of time, five to 10 minutes, and then take about 10 to 15 minutes of questions either from the audience or from our other panelists. So I am encouraging our panelists to chime in and test the mettle of our other presenters. If you have questions, please use the chat function or you can raise your hand, but the chat function is as preferred as this allows me to aggregate questions if they come up and they happen to be somewhat repetitive. Um, so that's what we'll do to begin. Once we've gone through all of the um, presenters, we will have some time for more thematic questions or questions that didn't come up at the end. So to begin, we're going to um, hear from Professor Wilner from the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs on exploiting chaos. Professor Wilner, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Uh, thank you, Professor West and all my colleagues. It's great to see you again. Alex Corbell as well. Um, listen, our, our, my, my presentation really should be done jointly with the PhD student who's writing, who, who wrote the chapter with me, um, Casey Babb, but he recently had a, a baby, so he's off for a couple of weeks, so I'm, I'm taking the mantle. Uh, but really, this is a joint uh, project, and it's really quite quite uh, Casey's brainchild. Our contribution to the larger volume is, uh, is itself funded separately from a number of different sources. And so over the summer, we received um, our own D&D um, grant through the COVID-19 challenge uh, program. 
and uh, separately through the Canadian Network for Research on Terrorism, Security and Society, otherwise known as TSAS. So we're working with two, two different pools of money to, to compile our, um, our data. And what the, our chapter to the volume does is try to provide kind of some preliminary findings. So projects ongoing, um, I assume or we have another you know, couple months to a year left. So, so what I'm presenting to you is a kind of a cold notes version of what uh, we've accomplished so far. The larger project, as I'm alluding to, has four kind of buckets within it. And the first has to do with exploring those global general trends um, within the specific nexus of COVID, public health measures, and then uh, online malicious activity. And particularly here, we're looking at uh, non-financial criminal activity online. And so we're not so much dealing with the cyber hacking or ransomware attacks, which is something worth exploring. We're exploring how at what we would call violent non-state actors are using uh, the COVID and pandemic situation to further their own agenda. So that's kind of what we're exploring. And um, the second larger bucket has to do with uh, an empirical exploration of this, right? So we want to we want to lead, you know, we want to lead in and explore theory and approaches and all the rest. But we also want to have a deep empirical assessment. And so we're building a data set of all events that we can uh, uh, um, identify to try to make sense of some of the more nuanced ways in which non-state actors are using the online space within the backdrop of COVID to make, to make, to make hay, basically. Then we want to explore policy, both from a Canadian and international and comparative perspective. And then finally, if only because D&D is one of the partners in our case, uh, there is an element specific to understanding whether or not the disinformation, misinformation space might alter or influence Canadian armed force engagement overseas as it relates to COVID. So these are the kind of the four buckets we're working with. And the goal, right, is to conduct interviews, do open source in, uh, uh, data collection. I think we're halfway there. Um, and then the next phase will lead us into 2022. Um, I should say also that we're really ideologically and motivationally agnostic. And what I mean by that is that we're not focusing purely on religious uh, inspired militant groups or ideologically inspired militant groups. We're really trying to catch anybody and everybody. There's a bit of a methodological issue there, I think, um, but we're working around it. Um, there are three underlying forces in, at play here um, before I get into the, the findings, right? The first has to do with the actual disease itself, COVID-19 and the pandemic. But related to that, of course, is the actual public health uh, response. And those two obviously go hand in hand, but the public health response is uh, distinct and different depending on the jurisdictions that you want to explore, right? So in some jurisdictions, you've got lockdowns, others, you've got mass mandates, you've got curfews in other, way, in other, in other areas, economic collapse is une unevenly felt, travel bans, and now, of course, uh, um, uh, vaccine and uh, on-ramping and the rest. So we're working with both of these areas, the, the disease itself, but also the public health measures. And um, the second element that we're working with here is the societal way in which we've most, most of us, uh, certainly in the West, quote unquote, have um, pivoted to online interactions, right? This is of course a case study in that itself. So um, we're working from home, we're going to school from home, but we're also sharing religious practices online. I'm sorry, we're working online. We're sharing religious uh, 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 services online, community events, governance, everything has moved online. And that's the kind of space that we're exploring because as we move online, militant non-state actors are also moving online to make sense of that themselves. And so we're exploring that third part, which is how non-state actors are integrating themselves into that information and dis and misinformation space to, to, promote, uh, um, their, to, to promote their strategic uh, interests. Um, all told, we've kind of, uh, you know, landed on three general trends. I don't think these are gen I don't think these are too surprising, but they have a, a flavor of COVID-19 and pandemic response to them. And so these are the three kind of uh, responses that I'll go through. The first has to do with the fact that what we're, what we're, what we're finding is that non-state actors are, are using the COVID-19 space to delegitimize governments, but also to legit legitimize their own response, right? And so there's a really interesting play there. Um, this is a classic thing that non-state actors have done before. It's not a COVID story, but we have a COVID lens to it. Um, and what they're doing is they're trying to target specific governments, both local, but also international, um, and to try to, to, to finger their response to the pandemic, and then suggest in the same vein that they themselves have a better response to the pandemic itself, right? And so they're delegitimizing public responses and the governments behind them and legitimizing their own response. And we see this across the board, right? So Al-Shabaab blames the African Union for spreading the virus across Africa, but also in Somalia. We've got Boko Haram um, calling the plague, you know, God's punishment against um, secular Muslims. 
You've got the Taliban using social media to promote their type of response, their own public health, where, uh, uh, public health awareness campaigns, right? In juxtaposition to the Afghan government. ISIS, right, suggesting, suggesting that local governments um, are withholding information on the virus. If you turn to the far right in your in Europe, um, you know they're promoting their own alternative economic assistance efforts, right? Different, distinct from the government themselves. Other far right groups across the globe are trying to use this to promote access, accelerationist and eco-fascist uh, uh, narratives and motivations. And then finally, even the far left, right, is tapping into the especially the economic angst um, to try to push a specific populist movements, anti-elite, often anti-Semitic narratives and tropes. So the delegitimization feeds into the legitimization and there's a nice interplay there between the two forces. A second kind of finding from our, from our examples here it has to do with recruitment. Um, and so we lots of emerging evidence to suggest, right, that, and this is, again, this is not new to COVID, non-state malicious actors have been using cyberspace to recruit beforehand, but there is a lens, there's a COVID lens that we can explore and unpack. Um, and so while they're pitching their own uh, more effective response to COVID-19, um, they're also trying to recruit members or at least recruit support to their larger base. Um, and I think that recruit pro recruitment process, if you want to call it that, looks a lot like um, or has a flavor of the, what the group has done in the past, right? So ISIS, for instance, will note in its um, uh, social media, right, that uh, only, tr you know, it, true believers will become immune to COVID, right? So they're kind of layering on this aspect to it. And Al-Qaeda will do something similar that it's, you know, COVID-19, the pandemic is God's wrath. And, and if, only, if, if only their base would turn back to Islam, then, um, you know, it would help save parts of the community and the Ummah more, more broadly. And then if you turn to the far right, um, quite prevalent here as well, right? They're co-opting the pandemic and they're really playing on that angst against the government, something that existed previous, of course, but they're trying to spread those conspiracy theories and to radicalize and recruit supporters. And we're seeing that now, um, you know, a pivot from stop the steal to stop the vaccine. We're seeing that now emerge um, uh, as it relates to the vaccine drive in the United States in particular here. And so that's a really interesting way in which they kind of play with this narrative. Um, you know, underlining all of this in terms of number two, uh, you know, has to do with that pandemic's toll, right? So it's 14 months, 15 months that we've been dealing with this uh, internationally. And there's deep economic and communal hardship. There's unemployment. There's a physical and social isolation. There's a mental health and psychological aspect to this. There's individual hardships, community-based hardships, political uncertainty, and go on. All of these factors feed, right? They feed, it feeds the momentum of recruitment and, and, and perhaps radicalization and, and violence. And so it's not just COVID, it's about all of the underlying effects here. And then finally, that third piece that we're exploring um, has to do with incitement of violence. So this is where we cross over from physical or digital, sorry, cross over from digital space, cyberspace into physical space in some cases. Um, and, you, and you see evidence, right, of, of militant groups trying to promote um, certain measures, active measures, acts of intimidation and acts of violence related to COVID, right, in physical space. And so you've got ISIS particularly, right, urging um, its supporters in the West uh, to go and attack hospitals in the West to try to add an extra burden on hospitals that are themselves already burdened because of the pandemic, right? You've got the far right in Europe, um, you know, playing on that kind of Turner diary approach, try to say like, let's, let's use uh, COVID to, to launch biological attacks against particular communities, especially ethnic communities and, minor, and minority groups, right, in urban settings. Um, and then you've got, you know, the capital riots in January is an interesting kind of microcosm. It's not a pure COVID storyline, certainly not. And it's, it's not just about pandemic response, um, but there are lace, it's laced into it, right? And so it's an anti-government response that's laced with the pandemic. And again, I think there's an emerging anti-vaccine element to that as well, which is really interesting. Um, similar violence in Canada, right? We've had attacks against minority groups, Asians, uh, Muslims, and Jews, um, and attacks against uh, uh, public figures, including the prime minister. And so again, not a pure COVID story, but there's a lace of it uh, within there. Um, so I think, right, uh, and this, I'll finish here, the next steps for us beyond the chapter itself is to go and build that empirical record to, to, pro to provide a more nuanced uh, assessment of what's happening um, and to build on what we've uh, suggested is, is occurring. And then to kind of do the so what response, which would be, you know, how do we how do we effectively manage what we're, we're exploring here? Because again, our sense is that this is going to continue, not necessarily the pandemic, but the, the effects around the pandemic will continue, certainly the economic side of things. And our militant storyline here will continue. So we want to make sense 
of what to do, not only from a security intelligence community perspective, that's, there is something there to be done by the SNI community in terms of you know, awareness of emerging trends, but this is a much larger storyline and it has to do with uh, you know, international consortium, private sector, ability to manage uh, the dissemination of misinformation and disinformation online. There's a hard economic element here, right? That's not an SNI solution, it's just how do we rebuild the societies? Um, and then how do we provide counter narratives? That's gonna be probably a bottom up or grassroots approach. And then finally, right, just the pol polarized political environment, certainly in the US, Europe, maybe in Canada, that requires a solution as well. So Leah, I, I will stop there, um, right? This is a work in progress, um, but, but so far we're pretty happy with it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Professor Milner. So um, if any of the, um, I'm going to put up my gallery view and I do have the chat open. So if you would like to ask a question, please put it in the chat or raise your hand, um, especially those who are the other panelists. Um, I invite you to um, test your co-panelists and learn from each other. So we'll start with a question from uh, PhD student Nipsia, Ms. Jessica Davis. Hi, Jess. Hi, Professor Wilner. Uh, thanks for that. That was really interesting. I was wondering a little bit about the effect of lockdown on militant violence or non-state actor violence. So there's been a fair bit of debate about, you know, COVID will create more opportunities or, or reasons for violence, but then what's the effect of the actual lockdowns and the restrictions of movements and then like, and availability of targets as well? Yeah, it's a fascinating question, right? My gut told me at the beginning of this, right, Jess, maybe you maybe had the same sentiment, that there was less room because of lockdowns and other measures to conduct physical attacks. Um, and I think we, if you were to go look at the data, I wonder, right, like gun violence probably dropped in the United States during the first wave. Of, of course, that spiked over the last three weeks, unfortunately, right? So I, I think there's a, there's a sense that um, as physical space shrunk, that uh, the ability for these groups to conduct physical attacks also shrunk. I'm not sure. That's my that's my gut. But I, I you know, I, I'm open to other suggestions. But I think as we open up, you know, as we open up our societies, um, I think we're expecting to see the the culmination of all of these uh, developments online, which will then I think propagate physical um, responses. Um, so my question for you is, you talked about a little bit about it, narratives, and, we've, and you mentioned specific, you know, hate-based violence in Canada, but are, are you seeing any narratives that are specific to Canada or Canada's response to COVID in this? Yeah, no, so not yet. So I think, you know, truthfully, we've been doing the kind of wide angle lens so far, and we're just trying to collect as many points of, you know, single points of data, like the ones I listed, right, from across the globe. Um, there are specific Canadian elements. I think if you were to drive down deeper, you'd find even regional sentiments. You'd find something happening in Quebec that looks a little bit different than in Alberta. It looks a little different than in Toronto, if you could parse the data together, uh, parse the data even more thoroughly. So I, I, I think, again, Leah, like the hunch is, yes, we're going to see some of that um, as we start really uh, diving into the data. But so far, we're seeing that kind of classic global examples that really do kind of hew to the, you know, I said we were agnostic, but Al-Qaeda has a certain pitch here, right? And far-right communities have a certain pitch and we're, we're seeing that classic pitch, but it'll be really interesting to see whether or not there's an actual Canadian flavor, um, and, but not yet, we haven't seen it just yet. Professor Corbet. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, uh, Professor Wilner. Um, one thing hi, I'm Alex. hoping, hi, hi Alex. Um, one thing I'm looking to, um, uh, right about in the near future, I'm interested in, in your view, given your ongoing research, is the long-term implications of our kind of quick move to digitalization in the COVID-19 context. A lot of individuals who write on tech policy have basically made a rough estimate to say that because of the pandemic and because of our move online, we've kind of seen this 10-year jump happen in the period of a year, uh, a year plus. I'm wondering what you think the long-term impacts are um, for violent extremists and terrorist activity online the impact in the physical world, you know, through radicalization of violence as well as terrorist attacks, um, due to the kind of current period that we're in of increased digitalization. Yeah, it's a great question, Alex. Uh, Alex and I, we partnered in the Capstone class separately, right, through Capstone, Nipsia, and Public Safety, and we're working in that digital space, Alex, as you know, with you and your colleagues at Public Safety. Um, I think you know it's a it's a great question, and I I, I really do like that idea that um, we're fast forwarded ten years. We hear the same thing from the private sector, right? Like online sales are ten years ahead or five years ahead of where we thought they would be. And same thing if you go to Amazon or Walmart or Shopify, like their 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 long term projections have been shortened very quickly. And so I wonder, like you know, taking that 
uh, observation and then applying it to the things that we're talking about today. Um, I, you know, I would suggest that if, what, one thing is like, we're all getting better online. I have to say it like even, even this Zoom setup is sh much sharper than it was uh, at the beginning, right? So we've, we've learned to be more creative, protective, secretive or not secretive, uh, safety wise online and on our daily interactions, right? And so I think, you know, th there's a, I think there's a, there's a nice window of opportunity for militants to make sense of what's happening, but now the counter forces are responding, right? I think, I think they're responding. And so even these collaborative uh, setups, um, uh, as we get more familiar with them, as we get more attuned to them, um, as we build better regulations and better awareness of how elements of malicious activity are using them, our responses will kick in. And so you'll have that kind of cat and mouse, classic, right? We've had that in physical space as well. I would imagine there's a cat and mouse, but certainly a uh, cat and mouse element, but certainly the, 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 physic, the, the digital domain is much broader than the physical domain in terms of um, ability to interact with communities that are distinct and diverse and abroad. Right, and, and to make sense of different forms of information and the dissemination of that information. So, so that's the new element. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where we're gonna land. I would hope that you know, gatherings like this, books like Professor West's and, and other will help the practitioners in this case and other stakeholders make sense of what's happening, both in theory and in concept, and then we'll respond. So I, I'm a bit of an optimist. I like to be an optimist. I think there's an action reaction kind of thing. And we're, we're still in the midst of this, of course, but I, but I, I do think, you know, I'm still, I also, Alex, basically I'm an optimist. I think that we will respond. We are responding um, and then we'll improve. Thanks. So a question from uh, my MA student, Vincent, it's a little self-interested because this is the topic of his MRP, but uh, have you seen any evidence of veterans uh, participating or being targeted by misinformation in these narratives? That's a great question. And so that's a very uh, that's a good that very topical approach for an MRP. That, that's your that's your student, uh, Professor West. Yeah, Vincent, yeah. if you want to, you can elaborate on your question if you'd like. Hi, Vincent. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm doing research on veterans that may be adopting right wing extremist ideologies and kind of seeing yeah. how that fits into the greater landscape in the West. Um, so I was wondering if you've seen any evidence of mis or disinformation targeting veterans or the veterans themselves participating in spreading that information yeah i mean so i mean the cap you know if you're working on this now i think the capital right would be a great microcosm for this certainly because of the active uh, participation of current and former um members of the armed forces in the u.s um, and then i think you could probably so we've seen we've just dabbled with this but i think what we're understanding is that there is this call to arms right this call to arms saying that you know veterans who are on the sidelines of the Capitol riot are not uh, um, following with the, the call of duty, right? And so you, so you see this kind of motivating element. Um, and in Canada too, we've had, you know, uh, is the, the specific case against the prime minister was, you know, right? So, so we have evidence of, of usually it's former, um, but that ties into the, how the far right was also making inroads with the military before COVID. So it would be interesting to see, maybe Vincent, if you could actually do this to see how they were communicating amongst themselves pre-COVID and post-COVID and explore how the language changed and how the narrative changed. But certainly if you needed a, a proper case study, I think you, you could build a pretty good lens with specific individual case studies on the individuals that were implicated in the capital riots. That would be tremendous. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I don't know if you're able to answer this question. I think it might be a bit out of your wheelhouse, but I will I will ask it on behalf of, of sure. the, the, the person here is whether or not you think that there is a possibility of actually, I'm gonna say, um, you know, countering the disinformation with, and concerns about uh, mass vaccination. Of mass vaccination, yeah. Um, I, <laughs> no, <laughs> I think it's gonna be, like, so again, how does information and disinformation and misinformation spread, right? Countering the narrative requires us to put the forces of good, uh, doctors, public servants, et cetera, front and center. And we, we see evidence of this across the board, but then the counter argument you know, is you have those certain doctors, um, including some who are doctors who are anti-vaxxers who also rioted in, in January, right? They are also promoting a counter, their counter to the counter narrative. Um, um, for the anti and which supports the anti-vaccine. So I'm not sure exactly how to, how to do that. It's, you know, I think you need a communications or even a journalism student to kind of hash this out. But, but, certainly, um, but certainly what's interesting is, right, like the, 
this, the stop the steal has shifted to stop the vaccine. And so if we can under, just understand how, um, you know, it's not just QAnon supporters, it's much broader than that, but how that pivot can occur. Like, how can they so easily pivot from one core element of their foundations to another core element? And if we can start needling in with the logic, you hope that some people will drop off, just as some people have dropped off post, you know, post the, the transition phase of the government of the United States, people have dropped off out of QAnon. Okay, so what are lessons therein that we could add to the anti-vaxxers? But again, Leah, my, my point would be, you know, you fight dis and misinformation with just more good information, right? And the more stories of uh, older generations surviving COVID because of vaccines, the better you would think that some of those lessons would trickle down um, to a point, to a point. And then I'm not sure how you do it. It's not an SNI community thing. It's a broader whole of society uh, approach, but I think there's probably ways to figure out um, both in terms of how they pivoted and then how to build those kind of narratives. So I'll ask you one last question that just came sure. in, and it's whether or not you, you know, the people actually being captured by these non-state actors, um, by the disinformation or, or being captured and radicalized, whether or not that's changed um, through the shift in the lens towards COVID, or is it about the, like, the, the people being, you know, captivated by the misinformation and the, the radicalization, tend, have they, do they remain the same? And maybe you don't even know that yet. You mean like the, the people themselves, like the characteristics of the people being captured? Is that the sense of the question? Yes. The question is, have you recognized the shift in the kind of people who are being reached by radical right, or right, radicalized? Right. Mm -hmm. No, we do. I don't have a firm answer on that. I, again, my hunt, my hunch is this is what we're seeing is nothing new. All of these forces have been in play before the lockdowns and before COVID was a thing. Oh, you know, 2019 is not so long ago. This, these, these factors were emerging themselves, um, but we're seeing now the uh, all of these forces playing around and dovetailing and making sense of COVID and the response to COVID to up the ante and to increase the volume. I think the people that are susceptible, um, I think there's a strong mental health issue uh, crisis. Some people will call it emerging. That will feed into it, and then the economic malaise. I mean, right? If people who have no the people who feel that they have grievances, real or perceived, or not a lot of economic opportunities will be perhaps more attuned to uh, narratives that feed their uh, feelings of disempowerment. That existed before COVID, but of course, this will be amplified and the volume will be increased. So I think, right, there's, I wouldn't say there's a specific character or a person that's susceptible, but, but historically, we would suggest that there are and that the overall environment has allowed for more of these individuals to be present and for the volume of um, the volume and type of information that they're receiving to be increased as well. So again, no firm answers yet. That's kind of a cop out, but I think we're seeing traces of it from the past with that COVID lens uh, within it. So I know we're going to lose you likely. So I'm going to ask you my last question since I won't sure. get to ask it in the wrap up. Was there anything that you were expecting to find or anticipating that you didn't? Uh, that's a great question. I should have prepared something for it because I should have anticipated it. Um, you know, it's a work in progress. Uh, you know, I, we were surprised when uh, when we got funded. So I'll just suggest that, like, you know, at the first go, it was like, hey, there's COVID. Let's go see if we can get some pools of money. And we got like very, like, like, like you, Leah, right? We got very good feedback from public servants and from the, you know, forces that su 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 supply and support academic research in Canada. So that was a first surprise to us. Um, I, I would say that, you know, there are cross-cutting themes here. I said we were like thematically agnostic and I think we, that will still hold, but the way that the far right does this is sort of different than the way that the far left does it. Um, the tools may be the same and they may even share the platforms and maybe there are like core fundamentals about how you package disinformation and misinformation. Maybe those things will be shared, but they, they, they you know, and Islamists and ISIS, Al they, they do it differently as well. But it's the, it's the core nuggets in the logic of the disinformation that's really interesting, right? And the misinformation. It's like, it has to speak to the things that you already believe and want to do. And so it's how do they tweak the message from the, you know, from the, co the common ground of COVID and lockdown? How do they tweak the message to resonate with people that are susceptible to far left, far right, Islamist and other issues? Um, that's really interesting. And I, I'm not sure yet, we, you know, we, I'm not sure what we're gonna find. I think there's gonna be small nuances. Um, about how that's done. But then again, the platforms are used probably in a similar way, uh, the way that perhaps that they that things are resonated and, you know, the, uh, I think the way that messages are resonated online, probably share common characteristics, but it's how do you pivot 
the logic to make sense with the things that you do, that could be a surprise for us down the road. Great, thank you so much. Uh, that was a great start. Um, going to be follow up, I'm sure, by equally fascinating research um, by Jessica Davis and uh, thanks, everybody. Professor Corbet. Thanks very much, Professor Wilner. Um, on surveillance, ethics, intelligence, and priorities in, in uh, a global pandemic. So I'll turn it over to uh, Jessica and Alex. Great, thanks so much, Professor West. Um, so our chapter is actually called A Health Intelligence Priority for Canada, Cost Benefits and Considerations. And this for me is really part of some research that I started at the beginning of the pandemic where I was really wondering like, what is the, the national security and intelligence reaction going to be uh, to the pandemic? And, but for this piece, I really wanted to explore the impact in terms of intelligence more broadly for Canada. So it was really natural for me to reach out to my former professor of intelligence studies here at NIPSIA uh, to help with that. So the thing that struck me is when the pandemic started, states around the world looked at the increasing infection rates and wondered what they could do to stop the spread of COVID-19. Test and trace quickly emerged as one of the most promising approaches, but there was a real disparity in how states thought to do this. Some states saw this as a purely health problem, while others saw their security and surveillance tools as possible solutions or partial solutions to the pandemic. A number of states deployed tools that we would traditionally associate with national security to trace the spread of coronavirus. And this met with mixed results. Actually, I'll, I'll rephrase that. It actually met with rather poor results because it turns out that COVID-19 was spreading far too quickly to be effectively surveilled through mechanisms that have primarily been designed to identify and surveil individuals or small groups of people. So the mass spread of COVID-19 through the population really made a lot of these tools fairly useless. So for instance, Israel tried to use their existing counterterrorism surveillance tools to identify the spread of COVID-19, but that didn't stop their infection rates from skyrocketing. And there's very little evidence that their use of these intelligence tools had any effect on reducing infection rates. They may have been able to track those infection rates. What they did with that information remains unclear and its impact on their coronavirus response, particularly in the early days of the pandemic, uh, seems fairly limited. On the other hand, South Korea was very aggressive using any and all of its surveillance tools and was quite uh, innovative in terms of using financial transactions, so financial intelligence, to identify the location of indi individuals suspected of coronavirus infection or who may have been exposed to the virus. This may have helped South Korea get a handle on their infection rates, but it doesn't seem to have been a persistent or lasting approach for South Korea. Instead, they seem to have pivoted to more traditional health approaches once they got that sort of initial infection spread under control. In Canada, the story is really different. So our laws, specifically the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, as well as our intelligence culture, really prevented any real use of intelligence tools against the coronavirus. And this was never really discussed, which is no surprise to anybody who's worked in that, in that field. Instead, in, in particular, the rapid spread of the virus in this country, as in others, would also have made these tools relatively ineffective. You know, in Canada, they're very much designed for relatively targeted surveillance, not mass surveillance. So again, same problems that other countries actually ran up against. But, and rightly so, Canadians are quite keen to learn what could have been done better in terms of Canada's response to the pandemic. And there have been some suggestions that better intelligence on, on the emergence of the pandemic, so warning intelligence, could have helped Canada be better prepared. A lot of this discussion has been focused on the Global Public Health Intelligence Network, uh, what it was intended to do and what it actually did and whether it could have been better used or improved in, in the future as a tool. Uh, yesterday, great timing, the AG actually released a report that was fairly scathing in this regard. Of course, this is a very important question. There's a, an ongoing debate in academic circles and among practitioners about the nature of it, but many have convincingly argued that we are now in the age of the pandemic or pandemic era. Um, that's really driven by four interrelated processes, global warming, income growth, urbanization, and globalization, which make pandemics both more likely and potentially more deadly. 
In short, global warming damages ecosystems, uh, damages the health of these ecosystems, making the emergence of new disease more likely. Income growth increases meat consumption uh, and in turn deforestation and increased contact between humans and animals. The same could be said with deforestation uh, due to mining or deforestation due to the production of timber. Urbanization and then globalization both increase the pace at which disease spreads, both domestically uh, within countries and of course internationally from one internationally connected uh, city to another internationally connected city. And these intertwining processes are occurring in developing countries across the world, uh, but increasingly and worryingly in um, developing countries that do not have the appropriate health infrastructure and, who, and countries that are facing public health issues uh, that increase vulnerability to disease in the first place. If we, if we accept what Alex is saying here about the sort of age of the pandemic, it really makes a strong case for needing a really robust after action review or lessons learned about what the Canadian response was to the pandemic and what could have been better. And a related question then becomes, should we expand or use our national security and intelligence tools to track and respond to pandemics writ large? When we look at our allies, we learn that the United States' National Center for Medical Intelligence actually determined that there would be a global pandemic in February 2020 and was alerting about the new illness spreading through Wuhan back in November of 2019. That intelligence was shared with allies. The Quadripartite Medical Intelligence Committee began writing on and issuing warnings about COVID-19 in January of 2020. So to a certain extent, it actually doesn't appear that early warning was an issue. There were warnings if Canada, or, the, or for that matter, the United States chose to listen to them. Of course, uh, with any, any intelligence problem, it's really easy to overwarn and getting policymakers to pay attention to warning problems is never an easy task. But this also raises the quest questions about what an enhanced role for Canadian intelligence would have in terms of effect for future pandemics, because a lot of the function of intelligence is that warning piece. In our chapter, we argue that there's certainly room for more information sharing between intelligence and public health officials, and that there's, there's good reasons to think that this can be done uh, fairly easily within our existing structures and frameworks. But the question we want to know is, should Canadian intelligence assets, limited as they are, be deployed to tackle health intelligence? Or is there another way to achieve the desired effect of better early warning? Some of the things that could have been done perhaps with better warning, you know, might have included better personal protective equipment or providing better information to health officials on how the virus actually works, which may in turn have led to better policies to combat the spread of COVID-19. But I think the thing that's really critical here is that early warning doesn't necessarily mean better and early action. The US example illustrates that just because public officials know something doesn't mean that they'll take action or that their policy actions will actually improve the health of the public. Importantly, as we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemics can be politicized. We've seen this in authoritarian countries, semi-authoritarian countries, and democratic country responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. And while pandemics certainly have national security implications, the case remains unmade as to whether deploying Canadian intelligence assets to better detect pandemics would have a beneficial effect. I think I made this point most saliently on Twitter, if you can imagine, uh, when I talked about the idea that Canadian intelligence is a pie and that pie isn't gonna get bigger after the pandemic. In fact, there's probably arguments to be made that it's gonna get smaller. So it's really about figuring out where we want, how we want that pie to be sliced and whether health intelligence should be one of the slices within that pie. The temptation will likely exist amongst Canadian policymakers to create or bolster a health intelligence priority. But we think this is something of a solution looking for a problem. It's unclear what dedicated intelligence collection on this would yield in terms of action and why this would be better than simply enhancing or listening to the global public health intelligence network. Certainly sharing any and all relevant information across departments will be critical. The possibility exists that intelligence can surface well in advance of the next pandemic. And this should obviously be provided to the relevant departments and agencies. But retooling Canadian intelligence to focus on this as an intelligence priority may have deleterious effects, including for privacy, effectiveness, and national security writ large, again, if that pie gets sliced uh, a bit thinner, and may create more duplication rather than efficiencies.
Now, this is not to say that intelligence agencies cannot be leveraged to the benefit of pandemic preparedness, rather that there are dynamics that will take place beyond the mere prioritization, collection, analysis, and dissemination of relevant information. The dynamics such as politicization, which we've spoken about, the deterioration of other intelligence uh, capabilities and capacities, and the duplication of other ongoing government activities all have to be taken into consideration. Where the use of intelligence agencies might be beneficial is understanding how other countries are responding to health crises within their borders, the truthfulness of other governments' assessments of their domestic situation and response, and implications for Canada. That said, these activities alone will not prepare Canada for the pandemic era for the reasons Jessica has stated. Great, thank you so much. And I actually want to pick up um, on your last point, Professor Corbet, and to either of you, the examples that you just provided in terms of where Canada's intelligence agencies could be of most use without duplicating efforts, strikes me as something that we would call foreign intelligence. So not necessarily security intelligence about a threat related to the security of Canada, but actually about the capabilities, intentions, and activities of foreign states. Currently, Canada can only collect foreign intelligence outside of the signals intelligence realm um, within Canada. So we wouldn't necessarily be set up to engage in that kind of activity unless we wanted to rely surely on like overt open source types of information, which uh, Griffin does engage in. So I guess my question is, does this bolster the idea that there is a need um, in this current uh, pandemic environment, as I think that you, you called it, um, to uh, um, en enhance Canada's cap capabilities and capacity and reach of foreign intelligence. And I'll ask either of you. Yeah, I'll go ahead because I'll, I think Alex will have a bit more to say on this. So I think the way I see it is like would be more incidental collection, like as you say, sort of that piece of collecting within Canada and, and, and that in terms of bolstering the argument, I think Yes, to the extent that there's a really good argument to be made that we, Canada, would benefit from having better intelligence about foreign states' intentions and having a better picture of that. Um, I still remain a little skeptical about what the budget piece of that would look like, but uh, I'll kick it over to Alex to answer. So for, I would have to agree with, uh, with Jess as well. Um, really, it's, it's about leveraging that information, which is in the open source space, but also leveraging the alliances that we already have and sharing that information within those alliances. I think we've laid out in our presentation, as well as our chapter, um, the ways in which intelligence has uh, come to Canada with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, not advocating for a um, or retooling or refocusing, but rather kind of leveraging the information sources we already have um, to, to focus on uh, these responses by states and their implications for Canada as well. Great, so I will invite other panelists and other participants to uh, either raise their hand if they're panelists or write in the chat uh, questions. My other question to you, I, I won't be presenting my chapter today, but my chapter was on whether or not legally we could have used our intelligence agencies to actually engage in this collection. And my argument is that there is actually no capacity to have leveraged any of our um, intelligence agencies or surveillance tools legally at this point. Um, that said, um, you know, in the after action, those things could be amended. So I'm wondering if in, in your research, um, this goes to your point, Jessica, if you found any countries, not necessarily who engaged in the use of their national security surveillance tools, but who enforced the use of an app or made some sort of use of an app mandatory, right? So we did the COVID alert app as a voluntary thing, and it's proven to be largely um, a failed experiment. Um, but that's using surveillance outside the national security space, but then requiring it. I, I'm just wondering if you've come across any countries who did that or something like that. Yeah, so I think that there's been a couple that have like, I think Israel has actually done something fairly recently on this in terms of vaccines. So they're they're not necessarily forcing the use of like a, a tracking app, but they're requiring people to demonstrate the use, their vaccination state. And that's sort of done through an app. I think there's also a paper way to do it. Um, so there are some incidental ones. I don't think anybody's forced the issue. I think there's a lot of um, hesitancy to do that just because of access to smartphones and that kind of thing. And like, there are real barriers there. 
But I think the kind of the more interesting part of the question that you asked is really about whether Canada should consider the capability to do this in the future. And I think it all comes down to like that robust after action review, but like looking at other countries experiences with this, like what did using national security or intelligence uh, tools actually get these countries? Uh, to my mind, what I've seen so far has been very, very little. Um, so it speaks to a little bit of the whether we should even pursue it. Yeah, I'm just gonna, because I'm not presenting today, I'm gonna take a few of my minutes to say, I think that that's right. I just wonder if we build the tools in advance and they're ready to roll out expecting down the road that this is build them into kind of a public health intelligence space rather than what we think of as classic surveillance, if we might be able to leverage the tools in, in a new and more efficient way. Um, and and to my, I don't have an answer to that. All I, the only answer I have to that is that there's no current legal way in which we could do it. So if we were, were to engage in some sort of mass surveillance or mass collection, um, there's absolutely no way to do it under Canadian law currently, despite what some other privacy advocates have suggested. So I'll turn over to Professor Wilner, you have a question. Hi guys, um, I was just wondering if, you, if your chapter dealt with um, not so much the use of intelligence um, apparatus to collect intelligence in public health, but, but, but the next step of actually encouraging ac action against public health, right? So it's like, what do we do with the intelligence? I wonder if you have thoughts thoughts on that because I think you're right there was perhaps a lack of intelligence but also a lack of inertial initial inertial uh, um, initial action to take to, to take measures um, I'm thinking back in March and April right so I wonder that next step if you might comment on that I've got a quick quick answer for you there um, the only real thing that we've sort of come across in our research and some of the other research that I've been doing for this is that um, there is probably a lot of space for lessons learned from the intelligence community in terms of crafting effective warning intelligence messages for public health officials. So there could be some overlap or collaboration there that could be really beneficial. Alex, did you have anything you wanted to add there? I agree. I mean, we have to definitely look at what was happening within these countries. Um, and, and Leah, to your question too as well, what sort of uh, affordances and authorities um, security intelligence agencies have in those countries as well. So for instance, if you take a look um, at some of the examples that, that we put forward in the chapter, um, and I'll look specifically at Israel, Israel's whole SNI community was put forward to address COVID-19. Um, and everything from understanding and tracking COVID uh, in, in the Israeli population, but also at the same time, trying to look at the, the intent and what's happening overseas. And then importantly, in made quite a few headlines in the New York Times, the use of Mossad to actually go out and try to procure uh, a lot of the medical equipment that would be needed for Israel to react to um, to the first wave of COVID. Um, now, of course, that's somewhat of a dip different circumstance, right? The reason Mossad was probably playing that role is because Mossad has a number of covert relationships with other st states that Israel doesn't have official relationships with that they leveraged during that period as well. Um, another example um, would be um, in another context would, would be Singapore, of course, um, intelligence agencies in that context have a have a larger role in society. Um, but you definitely saw a breakdown of trust in Singapore, whereby uh, it was promised to to the people in that uh, country that they wouldn't um, use that information for any other reason. And it quickly became apparent that they were using it for criminal investigations, for instance, in cases where there were uh, people who had witnessed a, a crime, particularly murders. Um, so I think there's a need to be very, very sensitive in terms of how um, we apply the, the lessons learned and how we transfer those lessons learned from, from very different circumstances, very, very different um, security intelligence cultures to Canada. Uh, there's a, a great piece in, in Warren the Rocks, for instance, with regards to the Israeli response written by a, a former member of the SNI community who says, you know, this is very kind of typical of about the way that Israel approaches these issues where they um, um, jump in to address the situation and then think about the implications after the fact. Um, not to say that that gets applied across the board, but, but in this circumstance, you can definitely see a, a full full press by the Israeli state. And the recent um, Supreme Court decision in Israel um, about um, the collection of, uh, of data through uh, uh, through the contract tracing um, was, was, you know, that should bet uh, um, role was uh, was limited uh, by the Supreme Court, given concerns about uh, personal information, privacy, et cetera. Great, thank you so much. Um, that was great. I, I know that we're going to lose Professor Corbet because he is a busy man, um, but we will have uh, Ms. Davis with us uh, for our, our final round of questions. 
So thank you very much. Um, we are going to now turn to the role of the Canadian Armed Forces and its uh, response in the global pandemic. Uh, so we'll hear from Professor Saman, who is joined uh, with Professor Von Hockey and, um, and one of his uh, NIPSIA students in writing this chapter for us. So uh, Professor Saman, over to you. Can you let me share the screen, please? Oh, uh, sure. Hold on. Since I'm talking about military stuff, the military has to talk in PowerPoint. I, I just always in PowerPoint. Hold on. Um, under security. Under security. Hold on. It's in the security box at the bottom of the screen. This is why we have extra. Oh, there we go. Bingo. All right. There you go. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> what I want to do today is, 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 is briefly talk about the, the paper we wrote. It was uh, myself, Stephanie Von Lackey at Queen's University, and Graham Hopkins, one of our NIPSIA graduate students, who has also been one of the three MA students who's been working with the Canadian Defense and Security Network for the past uh, year. He's, his time at, NIPSIA, at, at, at CDSN is coming to an end. Uh, and this is, uh, his research was key to our, our findings. So the basic question is, is how did the pandemic affect the Canadian Armed Forces? How did it affect what it was doing both at home and abroad? And the punchline is, is that it really depended on what the mission was because on, uh, some missions were more exposed to pandemic and that meant that they were more heavily affected and some missions were less exposed. And that's really depends on the nature of the enterprise. Uh, how often are you meeting other people, people outside your unit essentially? And so the first thing is, is Operation Laser was launched. Now, supposedly Operation Laser exists all the time in phase one, which is always standing by to jump into the fray. Uh, but it was really the activation of, of Operation Laser last March that launched the CAF's uh, uh, operations within Canada. And that took a most visible form, which was uh, sending uh, people into long-term healthcare facilities in Ontario and Quebec because they were ravaged by the disease and by, well, it turned out to be uh, poor preparation and poor training and poor personnel uh, techniques and all the rest of it. And so there needed to be something like a thousand uh, soldiers uh, from the CAF who went into these facilities. Um, so that was the primary effort. And that made the most news in two ways. Uh, one is that it was very visible to um, the public that we saw this, it was, the media covered it quite heavily because it wasn't what anybody was expecting. And the second was, uh, and then my second picture in the middle is of the report they wrote that, get, that then made it into the media, which where the report uh, where you had a, all these individual uh, members of the CAF of the Canadian of Forces in these uh, long-term care facilities report on abuse and neglect that these places had been uh, exposing or perpetrating upon their, the people they're supposed to be caring for. And so that created a lot of uh, news as well, in part because a lot of these facilities were supposed to be either owned or regulated by, the, by Ontario and Quebec. And I'll get back to that later. The second is that they also helped isol uh, isolated communities up north, uh, uh, First Nations uh, communities uh, in particular that had uh, limited healthcare capabilities and uh, had limited access. And so you had periodically, not just once, but uh, in the spring, then in the fall, and now again this winter, uh, the CAF sending troops up there to create isolation tents, uh, to evacuate people who are uh, ill and all the rest. So that was a very visible and important uh, effort by the, the Canadian Forces. The other, which we're hitting now, and you can see with a picture of uh, Major General Danny Fortin, is Operation Vector, which is the vaccination effort that the Canadian Armed Forces has both great logistic skills at being able to get stuff from point A to point C, uh, and uh, has uh, lots of personnel available to put uh, to be deployed. Uh, what we're learning about the Public Health Agency of Canada is they don't really have a lot of excess capacity to throw bodies at a problem. The military has that in, in great abundance, and so they've been doing that. Um, abroad, it's really dependent on the nature of the operations. So the first picture is of uh, Canadian Air, uh, the Royal Canadian Air Force that was involved in training the Romanians that as part of many of the missions that we've got going on, 
uh, the Canadian Air Force uh, was, uh, we sent uh, CF-18s to fly with the Romanians to help train them and also to be a presence that we are part of a variety of efforts to deter the Russians in their aggression in Eastern Europe. And so under Operation Reassurance, one, one part of that is an occasional deployment of the usual six, F six F-18s. And uh, the biggest change in this was they didn't do air shows, they didn't travel around uh, Eastern Europe because that would have led to more exposure. But if you're doing training uh, amongst pilots, you're either doing it on the tarmac, which meant that you could do it out in the open and it wasn't really gonna be that difficult and, or that you know uh, there wouldn't be much contagion or you're doing it in separate planes communicating to each other and that was not a problem. There are other um, Royal Canadian Air Force uh, planes out there doing things and some of those were more affected because those did involve operating the countries that closed down their, their air bases due to COVID and things like that. Uh, one of the major forms of Canadian involvement in the world is uh, the Canadian forces engaged in capacity building. That is training. That the CAF's biggest missions uh, outside of the Latvia mission uh, in, in Ukraine and in, in, in Iraq, uh, the, the Canadian forces are training other militaries. And those got postponed for quite some time and then gradually opened up because the challenge of those kinds of environments is you're constantly meeting new people and, and working closely with them as the second picture suggests. And as a result, uh, that, that provided uh, too big of a risk, uh, particularly in the uh, start of the pandemic. And so those were mostly frozen. The one in Iraq was also frozen because we forget, but it was a little more than a year ago that the United States and, Iraq, and Iran almost went to war in Iraq over the assassination of uh, Iranian General Soleimani. And so that changed the nature of operations in Iraq. So that was going on at the same time. Um, the last picture is of, of the Latvia mission that Canada has about 450 uh, troops in Latvia as part of the NATO uh, effort, enhanced forward presence to deter the Russians from attacking Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and Poland. And so we're based in, in Latvia and we're based along with I want to say eight other countries in uh, the Latvian battle group. The Canadians lead the battle groups. They have the most troops there of all these uh, forces and they command the battle group. And those eight other countries included Italy and Spain, which was pretty handy because Italy and Spain got hit by the pandemic first. And so the routines, the procedures to handle the pandemic uh, were, were shared pretty quickly and earlier than, than they were in other parts of the Canadian forces because these Canadians were working with folks who got hit earlier. Um, and the idea of this, that, that their training processes didn't change too much because uh, the way to think about Latvia is to think about the NBA playoff basketball bubble last year, where if you keep everybody in the same spot and they're not leaving that spot and nobody else is entering that spot, then you're reducing the risk of transmission. And that was the way it worked in Latvia, where you had a thousand troops roughly from all these different countries. And the idea would be to quarantine them before they go and to quarantine them after they come back. And that would minimize um, the exposure. And so the mission itself continued, continue to have these uh, troops working together, training to prepare for that next war with, well, Russia. Um, but that was different from the capacity building because it's a safe for, for the entire six month rotation. It's essentially the same people inside the bubble. Um, which is different from the, 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 the training efforts in Latvia and um, sorry, Ukraine and other places because there is a constant flow of new people. Now it turns out as we look closer into this, we learn more that the CAF has been a little bit uh, discreet about the troubles they've had because there have been problems. There have been uh, folks who are supposed to be on quarantine, not, not following the quarantine. There was one plane load of troops that were rotating in as a fresh set of troops and they got turned around because there had been some exposure uh, and then there was uh, some outbreaks uh, in Latvia uh, that they then had to respond to and the Spaniards reported it in their own media about how this was handled uh, but it didn't really get much play in Canada. Uh, what are the implications of all this? Well first of all uh, COVID as a disease it tells people what their pre-existing conditions are because those people with pre-existing conditions suffer more from the disease. Well, it does the same to political systems. It does the same to organizations that, that it reveals what problems exist beforehand. And so obviously in Canada, one of the big challenges is federalism that we've had 
lots of disagreements between the provinces and the, and, 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 the, and the feds about what to do about this crisis. And we've seen that within various organizations. And so what we learned, what we knew, we kind of knew before the pandemic that the treatment of, of uh, senior citizens in, in, in long-term care facilities probably wasn't optimal. Well, COVID revealed that it was far from optimal. In fact, there was abuse and neglect that was quite widespread and quite severe. So that we knew that it existed beforehand, but the COVID revealed it made it much worse, that it exacerbated the consequences of that. The second is that uh, we, we learned that pandemics are political. That means a lot of different things, but part of it means that you have politicians who have faced mixed incentives. I've got this sort of oops uh, picture from uh, of Doug Ford because he's kind of trying to figure out how to deal with the fact that the military blew the whistle on the fact that the uh, elder care facilities were in, you know, poorly managed and had all these records of ne neglect and abuse. This was a, basically a criticism of the Ontario government. And it was also a criticism of the Quebec government. And so it put those premiers in awkward positions because they had asked for these troops to help them out. And then these troops then blow the whistle on, on the state of being in, in these places. And they also faced mixed incentives because the longer the troops stayed there, then the less the provinces had to spend on nursing because the Canadian Armed Forces, while they could ask for reimbursement for what they do, they tend not to for emergencies like this. And so on the one hand, Doug Ford wants the, the, the nurses, doctors, troops to stick around from the CAF because he, he has enough to pay for them. He saves, saves the province money. On the other hand, he doesn't control them and they can say things that he doesn't like. Um, the third thing is, is that these kinds of operations, as some of the previous speakers suggest, are gonna be more normal. That uh, last January, before the pandemic, uh, Lieutenant General Ayer, who is now the acting CDS, but at the time was the head of the army, had observed that the army and the rest of the Canadian Armed Forces were increasingly stretched by the increased pace of operations, that uh, there had been fires and floods in, in, and uh, other kinds of storms and other and natural emergency triggered operations that um, it had been increasing over the past five or 10 years that climate change is real and it's, and it's causing uh, Canada to experience a variety of things that call for the Canadian Armed Forces to provide civil assistance to civilian authorities. And so he was noting before the pandemic, before it hit Canadian shores, that this was a problem. And while every defense review always identifies as among uh, its major priorities, domestic operations, it's always, you know, protect Canada, uh, uh, participate in the uh, binational defense of North America, participate in international operations, yada, yada, yada. Most of the attention of the Canadian Forces and most of the attention of, of the Department of National Defense and of Parliament and everybody else is on the expeditions, on going to Iraq or going to Ukraine or going to Latvia, going to Mali, whatever else. Less attention is paid on domestic operations. Indeed, actually, we scholars are guilty of this ourselves. There is not really that much uh, in terms of uh, defense scholarship of uh, political science on these domestic operations. Uh, so this paper is a first step in that because we really don't study it. So we don't really know what we do well, what we do poorly. What we do realize is we're gonna be doing more, more and more. And so what we need to have the Canadian Armed Forces think about is not just think about these things as emergencies that happen from time to time, but it's part of the day job. It's not just part of the thing that you have to do because you have to do it but it's gonna be regularly part of, of, of the mission set. And that might call for us thinking a little bit about what do we spend our defense dollars on and what does the Canadian Armed Forces spend its readiness money for and what it's training for because these domestic operations are gonna become a bigger and bigger part of their, their job. And the larger context of this is of course, the, the, the pandemic has killed more Canadians than any of the wars of the past. Yeah, I think you have to go all the way back to World War II to think of a war that affected Canadians more than, uh, than this pandemic has. So this may be some, there may be some need to start thinking about the priorities, not just the basic list of what Canada cares about, but really prioritizing this domestic operations. And that's what I've got. So I look forward to your questions and thanks for listening. So I have a question for you that uh, Professor Wilner wants me to ask as he steps out to take care of children, but he may have this on in the background is what does the domestic op as normal op do for recruitment and retention, do you think, for the Canadian forces? Uh, that's a good question. I think part of it is, is, is the, on the bright side for the Canadian forces, it's, this is a good news story, right? This is, this is a story about how the CAF is relevant, 
one of the things that the D the Department of National Defense and the Canadian Armed Forces are, are regularly agonizing themselves about is that they're not the public's not sufficiently aware uh, of the military. They were aware during Afghanistan, but then the awareness dropped afterwards. And so the first step to recruitment is to show that the Canadian Armed Forces are doing good things. The second thing is, is that one of the consistencies, despite the best efforts of, of the Canadian Armed Forces, the Canadian people still see the Canadian Armed Forces mostly in a positive light in terms of doing nonviolent stuff. That the Canadian Defense and Security Network did a, a survey last fall. Uh, and it's very clear from that survey that when the Canadian Armed Forces are doing things, the violent things are least popular and the less violent things are more popular. And so this kind of mission is very popular amongst the Canadian public. That there's a, while the Canadian military is still one of the most respected institutions in the country, I think this will probably push it a little even higher because you see the Canadians helping all of Canada through the vaccinations, through the elder care facilities, through uh, flying five massive refrigerators up to the north to, hold, is to contain the, the, vir the, the vaccines. All the efforts that they're doing domestically can only help in recruitment and retention of the force because it's popular. Now, on the flip side of that, the pandemic itself has stressed out the force just like it stressed out all of us, that uh, it has uh, caused people to have to operate very, very differently, um, that those who deploy abroad no longer have the usual support systems back home because, you know, who do you send your, you know, if you've got two parents of, of, uh, in a family who are both members of the armed forces, if they're both deployed, what do you do with them? Well, do you send them to your grandparents who are vulnerable to this disease? Um, childcare facilities, uh, schools, you know, all those things that affect all of us affect people in the Canadian Armed Forces. So the stress levels have gone up uh, and that's been a problem, but that that's not unique to the Canadian Armed Forces, of course. So I think in general, this has been a, a positive experience for the CAF in terms of, 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 of being a, a positive force in Canada and for, and for advertising for recruitment and retention. Um, just reminding everyone, that please put questions in the chat. My question for you is, do you think that this will help keep the CAF relevant in terms of funding? Or we're going to be going into a, a, a period of fiscal uh, restraint. Um, you know, the military and doing things that are violent uh, is one that we would think to, you know, in the past has really taken a hit when we do go into these periods. Um, do you think that this is, this might help the Canadian Armed Forces, or is it just that domestic ops are cheaper, uh, so it, it won't really help uh, it make sure that the Canadian Armed Forces stays flush? Uh, this is definitely something that they've been thinking about. I was at a meeting last summer where the leadership of DMD and CAF were trying to alert us that the, the message of defense cuts should not be inevitable. Uh, but the history of the, uh, is, says otherwise, because this is where the money's at, right? This is the biggest budget item in, in, in the, the, the budget. Uh, so the irony is that you might have the military praying for the liberals to stay in power since they don't care about deficits in the, in the same way that the conservatives say they, that they, they care about deficits. Um, it's a real challenge because uh, the stuff that ca the Canadian Armed Forces spends most of its money on, well, it spends most money on two things, personnel, which is probably not going to change, uh, and big budget items are the things that we see. So the ships and the planes, more than anything else. And so there's going to be, be some pressure on cutting the, the, the budget by cutting the military expenditure. But on the other hand, there's a political incentives to go the other way, which is all the parties don't want to upset Vancouver and Halifax over the various shipbuilding programs. Uh, and so I don't think that those, those programs will face much in the way of cuts, despite how expensive they are. So they're going to have to find other places to cut them. And th th there will be cuts. I, 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 you know, the, they, they, the, the folks in the DD and the CAF would say they're not going to be cuts, but there's going to be cuts. There's just no way around it. Um, so, what the CAF can do is try to play up this role in Canada the past year and say, we've done a really good job, don't punish us. And there'll be something to be said for that. But I think people who look at it will go, but yeah, but the things that you are spending lots of money on weren't used. It was personnel, it wasn't planes, and it wasn't ships, it certainly wasn't ships. Um, so that's, that's something to consider, uh, along the way. I just want to ask you one more question. And again, if anyone else has a question to ask, go ahead. Do you, and I, I should know this, but, uh, I may have forgotten. Do you think there's been any impact on Canada's participation in NATO, um, as a result of COVID, um, either in the last 
year or going forward? Um, uh, that's a good question. It allows me to say something I forgot to talk about earlier, which is I ignored the Navy entirely. I apologize to all our sailors, um, which is that what is the, the Navy is, is sort of the perfect example of what COVID, the COVID challenge, because if you're on a ship and you're not exposed to anybody else, you're not going to get the disease. As soon as you touch land, there's a great risk. And so we remember last year that an entire American aircraft carrier was beached and led to a, a real hullabaloo in the United States of it ultimately led to the Secretary of the Navy losing his job. Um, whereas uh, in Canada, we haven't had that problem because we've changed the rules. So the ships can still operate in NATO efforts. They just can't spend time wandering around port. You know, usually you have these port visits, which are both to relieve the stress of the, the sailors, but also as PR, uh, PR campaign uh, to show that, you know, the Canadians are here to help you out and aren't they wonderful people. And so now what happens when a ship uh, land, you know, goes to port, uh, it, the, the, troop, the sailors don't leave the ship or they don't leave the vicinity of the ships. So they don't go into the town. Um, and that has been mostly successful at keeping our ships from having the same problem that the Teddy Roosevelt had for the United States, which probably got the disease by having a port visit to Vietnam just at this, as this thing was uh, developing. Well, that's a long answer to the, to, uh, to the question. The, the, the short answer to the question is, Canada still has ships in the NATO fleets. It's currently leading the maritime standing, uh, standing group in the Baltics. Uh, it still has troops in Latvia. Um, it, and so the NATO, our participation in NATO has not changed. Um, some of the operations and the training exercises have gotten smaller or have been delayed. So in the Pacific, RIMPAC, which is usually this massive uh, sea-based and land-based exercise uh, of, of ships all across the, the Pacific, um, that has been downsized. We still had two ships par participating, but we had none of the land component and it was a much smaller effort than in the past. So those kinds of things are still going on. And, and yes, we're still as plugged into NATO as we ever were. Great. Thank you very much, Professor Stateman. Uh, hopefully you'll stick around. We're, uh, we're going to move to our next group of presenters, which are IPIS students. Um, we have Annie Wang and Raphael's Pozuelo, I'm probably going to pronounce that wrong. You can correct me when you go. Um, I believe you should have availability to uh, share a screen. So hopefully you can. Um, and we're going to hear from our IPIS students who as a, as a class essentially put together a chapter under the supervision of Professor Cardin with also assistant from, uh, from Ms. Davis on supply chain. So take it away. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Mia West. Um, I will let, just make sure everyone can see our slides. And Raf, are we ready to go? We are. Good, Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, awesome. So thank you for being here today. Annie and I are here to present on behalf of our team. We are presenting today on manufacturing, which is uh, one of the three components of the broader supply chain chapter. As you know, the sudden spike in demand for PPE, coupled with the disruption of global supply chains, severely limited the ability of the health sector to access these critically needed products. This disruption made it even harder for our domestic sector. In fact, it could not ramp up its production fast enough to compensate for the uh, dual supply shock. I will now pass it to Annie. That's right. So remember when um, pandemic struck, not did it only disrupt the healthcare system modes of operation, but also restricted its access to medical goods, also known as COVID-19 goods. So this is because the production of these goods tend to be concentrated in the hands of a relatively small number of companies, which themselves depend on a larger go global um, supply chain to produce them. So by definition, a resilient healthcare system should be able to maintain its essential function in the short term and in the long term, despite the double shocks of the pandemic and the disruption to supply chains. So that's why we need to discuss um, healthcare resiliency and the, the realizing of the system. So yeah, because the, if the ability to sustain those essential function are crippled and the health and safety of Canadians are compromised, it poses a direct threat to national security. Yeah, so what a um, resilient health 
uh, strong, what a strong domestic manufacturing can have bring uh, to the table are they can help us ramping up production to fill in the gaps left by foreign supplies, also provide innovative solutions to help extend the life of devices and the detect counterfeit and reduce resiliency. Slide. Yeah, I'm gonna not to now unto wrap to talk about some of the policy. Yes, um, thank you, Annie. Uh, as you know, government policy is the backbone of both the health and manufacturing sectors as they create the political and economic environment that these two sectors operate under. A policy can either support or frustrate production efforts, depending on the government's ability to fill the gaps exposed by COVID-19. These gaps include um, first import and export restrictions, creating resource constraints, Second, a low domestic supply of these products. Third, a freeze of economic activity because of weaker than normal demand created by the initial job losses. And fourth, production limitations brought on by um, physical distancing and other requirements. Uh, that being said, our government can come with policies to fix these gaps. But we, first, uh, we needed to know the exact production capacity of uh, medical mass manufacturers within our borders. We also need to identify any bottleneck that could hurt the production of these essential medical devices. Um, as, as, you, as we now know, Canadian government has, has taken appropriate measures since then, but there are important points that we need to uh, take into consideration. Namely, the creation of a comprehensive uh, national emergency plan with a uh, standard operating procedure and a clear chain of command in emergency situations. Uh, these could promote swift communication and a faster mobilization of resources, as well as a timely diffusion of essential information, which is very important in this era of mis and disinformation, right? And um, yeah, second, we also know that policy and legal limitations can impact the manufacturing sector's willingness to meet demands. I will now uh, pass it to Annie to talk about uh, the economics uh, incentives. Yeah, so another thing we remember is when H1N1 and Ebola ended, manufacturers were left with a lot of expensive equipment, material, business overheads to deal with. So they lost profit in the end because demand dried up and eventually there was no further incentive to produce masks. Therefore, we suggest that greater manufacturing incentives in Canada needs to be considered in order to promote domestic production from a long-term perspective. So this was one of the biggest takeaway. There are others, Pardon. yeah, important Pardon topics me, such as, yeah, no problem, such as tariffs and the cost benefits of uh, N95 using N95 versus surgical mask. So for time's sake, we're not covering that in this presentation. But if that's of anyone's interest, we're happy to discuss that during the question period. Yeah, next one. So um, after the policy and the economic um, section, we kind of looked at the uh, operational. So we look at, um, there are many efforts made by the industry to form partnership with the government and then to help ramping up the production. Yet there are still many challenges the industry were facing. Nope, next one. So one of the biggest area is procurement. And uh, uh, mostly the challenges lie in the procurement of raw material, both domestically and internationally. And then um, also procurement of automation and equipment. Lastly, uh, difficulty in recruitment of manpower due to COVID-19. So in one case study, we look at a Melbourne fabric. So Melbourne fabric is one of the most important raw material in mask manufacturing. It's the layer that blocks uh, the droplet. So the first figure in the presentation you see is an increasing asymmetric trace status of PP, poly, um, polypropylene. The, it's a plastic particles to produce Melbourne fabric. So we see from this chart very clearly that there is an increasing reliance um, at the source level so this problem coupled with other constraints like a really long lead time and expensive to set up plants. So eventually the um, manufacturing sector favored outsourcing rather than local production, which makes sense at 100% economically, but this caused a cycle of less and less spending in 
uh, research and development, leads to a higher technical threshold, and eventually completes the cycle and then turns into, and then does turn into the sector's vulnerability when China decided to ban all Melbourne fabric export in 2020. Outside. So another case study, we look at the procurement of automation. So in the video right now, you are seeing a complete assembly line sold by a Chinese company that has inbuilt quality control function using automated visual um, inspection technology. So Canada already have access to those automated and visual scan technology. In fact, they are operational in some of the air, in some um, medical device manufacturers, but has not been um, used in mask manufacturer sector. So we think this is a good point for the industry to reflect on. And we believe that Canada could become more resilient by uh, advancing and using those technologies. Slide. So now if we recall, uh, one of the concepts we bring up is vulnerability triad, which is um, the three aspects, technical, economic, and po uh, policy. Both cases they, uh, suggest that raw material shortage and technical defects and constraints results from the existing economic and trade structure that is heavily reliant on foreign import. So we must recognize that there is a trade-off here and the prioritization of profit come at the price of building a more resilient manufacturing industry. And it takes time and effort on all level to reverse the cycle and then eventually to better prepare for the next one. Right, with that, I'll pass back to Raphael. Thank you, Annie. So uh, as you know, PPE manufacturers faced multiple uh, technical dilemmas since the beginning of the pandemic. And I will brief you about one of them uh, and uh, medical device companies and health authorities, Canadian government, et cetera, would like to fight back the substandard counterfeit products that are spreading in, into our supply chains. Um, but if they do that now, uh, it will make it even harder for us to meet the current PPE demand that is very high. Uh, after research, we recommend that PPE manufacturers and our uh, business partners install end-to-end -end, uh, traceability systems, which will speed up the detection and removal of fake products. But to install these systems, manufacturers have to shut down their production lines for quite some time. And that is why they are likely to work on this only after the pandemic will be under control. Um, that brings us to the conclusion of our presentation. Uh, here are the four lessons learned uh, that we, we, we learned through our case study. That could increase the resilience of the PPE manufacturing sector in Canada. So first, an early and comprehensive government response is necessary. Uh, the government must be ready to fulfill the immediate needs of the PPE manufacturers and also of all their uh, business partners. We also saw that Canada wasn't as fast as the US to share plans on how to retool existing manufacturers into mask manufacturers. Uh, second, a reevaluation of economic links to compete with foreign manufacturers. In fact, we need to reevaluate our current strategic framework to build a more diversified market structure which will reduce our dependence on foreign sources. Third, uh, research and development and economic innovation can help promote resiliency. Uh, we should encourage the manufacturing sector, uh, this manufacturing sector, to increase its use of automation. Uh, the medical device sector shall also be stress tested to ensure its resiliency against future pandemics. And fourth, as we just discussed, uh, we should consider the implementation of a traceability system for a better quality assurance so uh, thank you for your interest in our presentation and we, uh, we warmly welcome your questions. Thank you. Uh, that might have been the best set of slides I've ever seen. Uh, <laughs> very nicely done to the both of you. Thank you. So my first question is you talked about incentivizing um, increased manufacturing or keeping manufacturing in Canada. Um, can you talk a bit more about that? What, what, what an incentive look like with this? How would that work? Um, I believe inside Canada, we already have uh, advanced manufacturing technology. Uh, in fact, I work for four years for a company that manufacture automation for the pharmaceutical and medical device industry. Uh, but uh, that, that's just, of course, like one 
drop in, in the ocean, but our company had maybe 90% of our business outside Canada because mostly people outside Canada were interested in what we do. Uh, and I think the government could have helped us and many of our many of the other players in, in Canada, we have a great technological and engineering industry, but maybe we need uh, some help so that Canadians get to know better what we are capable of. And, and we definitely already have many of the technologies here to, to, to help our own good. So in case of a policy, I think maybe uh, better funding, better recognition. Also the minimum requirements around medical device production uh, could be a bit uh, tighter in, in certain areas. Thank you. Annie, did you want to add anything? Yeah, just a couple of thoughts. So one of our, um, one of our teammate, Richard, wrote the, uh, wrote the economic section. So I think he might have better to say, but I, I know that right now um, we were thinking of if there were to have an incentive program, what it would look like. And then we thought it was, a, it was really a big tax for us to tackle, so we didn't go into there. But we know there are, right now, there are um, programs that similar to that, like the Ontario Together program, which um, give out, it sets out in incentive for, to develop research and development. Um, there are, um, there is another um, stock program, NES, National Stock Program that is to looking to add um, stock to the, uh, to, I think that's not part of a supply chain, but that's what they plan to do to add in that resilience and aspect in there. And also I know there are partnership formed such as between like 3M and then um, and then uh, government level that they, they're looking at how to help other manufacturers from, for example, auto, um, other auto manufacturing sector or clothing manufacturing sector, how can to help them? What are the th sources they need? And then to help them to develop and come forward at the front line and then to build in more material. So we really hope that there are a more concrete um, policy framework could be coming out to address this incentive program. But I think the government are and the industry are working together uh, right now. Yeah. So in terms of framing this, and I think it's obvious to you, but to those in the audience, what is the failure that you identified here or the, the lack of preparedness? What was the impact for Canadian security as, and, and Canada's capacity to deal with the crisis, do you think, in your opinion? Um, okay, I, I think I can start speak a little bit. Um, I, to me, I think the biggest takeaway as I wrote part of the section was the trade-off that we must recognize, which is globalization. But very simply, I think a lot of people that are anti-globalization that are um, against some of the trade agreement right now would argue the point. It is because we see that even though the industry tried to start really hard to, to ramp up the production, they want to help out and build in, you know, protecting our people. Like from the very source level, even just to get the fabric, we couldn't get it, right? Because we don't have the capacity. We decided not to produce them from 2000, um, starting 2000, 2005, it started to have that trade. Um, it was one of the slides, the trade status started to just really um, getting larger and larger. So it's really that prioritization of profit at the end come back to hit us. So to me, that was the biggest takeaway. And I think if we continue the cycle and say, we're gonna rely so much on globalization and, and then if it's not a pandemic, it could be another thing. It could be maybe a war. Then does our supply chain just get crippled and then we can't get food, we can't get the things we need. So I think that's a point that I was really start to um, think about. I think that's really the tie to national security is the ability to um, produce, the ability to self-sustain. Thanks, Ali. Raphael, yeah, did you me. add anything? Um, I think Annie really framed it uh, correctly. Um, I will add that uh, Canada was maybe over uh, relying on certain allies for its uh, supply of medical device. And I think we need to consider that we, we need a certain minimum threshold of our own medical device production to be here in, in Canada, where we will be able to uh, increase or decrease uh, their production as we need. Great, thank you so much to both of you. That was a fantastic presentation. Thanks a lot, um, Gia and everyone. Thanks.
So stay with us. Um, so if all of our panelists want to um, turn on their, their cameras, we're going to start kind of thinking about things a bit thematically or answering more questions from the audience that may have come up um, over the course of the presentation that you can ask to multiple panelists or to, to one individual panelist. Um, so I guess the, the one thing I want to ask about, and maybe I'll start with you, uh, Jessica, um, is this idea about ethics and, and response to the pandemic. Um, and, and this isn't necessarily, it's one aspect of your, of your paper, but you know, speaks broadly is that there's a lot of ethical questions about how we respond to, to the pandemic, both in terms of surveillance, in terms of um, you know, whether or not we're gonna continue to commit to our, our military uh, partners, our military commitments, whether it's vaccine nationalism, um, I don't know if, if anybody wants to, to think about how you've seen the role of ethics versus national security play out here in, in the specific issues that you were you're researching. Yeah, I think in the in the work that I was doing on this, it was a bit of an interesting piece because I would say that generally speaking, there's a really robust ethical framework for intelligence that's sort of been written about in intelligence studies. But I think that the pandemic really challenged that, particularly in the sense of proportionality. So because so many people, especially in the early days of the pandemic, were getting sick, we didn't really understand the consequences of the, of the illness. Um, and then there was a lot of deaths. I think that it really shifted the proportionality argument for sort of enhanced surveillance and enhanced monitoring of individuals. And it was a really interesting thing to watch, especially in Canada where we have a lot of individual rights and I think a fairly low tolerance for government surveillance compared to a lot of other states that we've talked about today. Um, and just sort of seeing how that um, tolerance for enhanced surveillance or enhanced involvement of the government and that kind of thing shifted. And I'm actually surprised by how little it did. So it doesn't seem like a lot of Canadians were keen to have the government on their cell phone in, in the COVID-19 app. Um, and so we're even less interested in having other kinds of surveillance um, imposed upon them. But in other countries, it was totally different. So South Korea, again, is a great example. They didn't really seem to have a lot of problems with uh, the enhanced surveillance of the population for COVID-19 reasons. Um, I was speaking to actually one of, my, one of my friends who's in Hong Kong and his argument was really that um, North America has a profound disregard for elderly life. I think that's <laughs> that Professor Statham and touches on this a little bit in his presentation um, that we didn't necessarily, and that in, in a lot of the Asian countries that have, had really robust responses to the pandemic, that that's one of the things that can explain the difference or the variation in the responses. Um, and again, it sort of relates to that surveillance piece as well, like sort of more acceptance of surveillance to try to cut down that spread um, and really stop it. Whereas in North America, it doesn't seem to have been quite that way. Great, does anyone else wanna to add to that? Wonder if I could add something in there. Absolutely. Yeah, it's just my personal view. It's not part of the paper, but I, I'm also very interested in this topic as I was looking at, you know, response taken by um, Korea and China. And I, and one other thing I noticed, um, and then is that they have um, when when the government says we need to do this, and then the, the just the people have less of a sense of individual individuality. They will think like, yes, we're doing this, we're accepting the Australian under a very special circumstances. It's for national security, so they have like a general have a broader sense of national security and then less sense of individuality. And I thought it was very fascinating how, to see how um, the constitution, how democracy has to play and then how the political system has such an impact. And it's, it's you can argue either side, but um, it's very interesting when it comes to ethic, how we think the ethic that we perceive as perceiving a right sometimes could come into the way when certain things need to be done. I would just say uh, the ethics of the, all this is that it's interesting that the military, when it does domestic operations, is in a weird position where they say that they communicate well with the provinces and all the rest of it, but they they don't they don't always make it abundantly clear exactly the full range of what they can and cannot do. Like when you go on a foreign campaign, you don't release your rules of engagement because you don't want the, the adversary to know what you can and cannot do because then they can use that to your advantage. And in in Canada. The rules of engagement should be transparent because 
the disease doesn't read your rules of engagement and then try to circumvent them. Fires don't do that. Floods don't do that. Ice storms don't do that. But there is a, a challenge, which is that if they make it abundantly clear what they can and cannot do, then they'll be asked to do more. And they would rather have the provinces do as much as they can and the cities do as much as they can and the other entities in Canada do as much as they can. So they're not asked to do things that they can't do or, or they don't want to do, like clean up after they've, you know, the, they'll put out the, um, the sandbags uh, during a flood, but they don't see it as their job is to remove them. And so for the pandemic, you know, they don't mind helping out in the nursing homes and all the rest, uh, but they don't want to be doing it forever because they, the, the, they have the, these nurses, these doctors, these medics, their day job is handling the medical problems of the force, not of the public. And so if they're stretched taking care of these nursing home facilities forever, then those, they're not available to take care of the force or deal with other things. So the, the Canadian Armed Forces is always stuck with these trade-offs about how much help to offer or because they, they see their job is to give aid to civil power or assistance to civil authorities, but they don't always want to be abundantly clear about it because they don't want to be over, overstretched. Is there a sense, Professor Saidman, and I mean, I had my personal opinions back when I was in the armed forces um, about the value of domestic operations um, within the Canadian Armed Forces, at least in terms of whether or not that's really their job um, or you know, do they embrace the role of, of dumb up? Well, it's interesting they put it that way, Professor West, because I get the impression from the way they look at it. I, I mean, I haven't talked to them. I haven't done, conducted interviews. Again, every defense review puts domestic operations number one. But they certainly, in their doctrine, in their training, they don't really say that. Now, I, what I'd be curious about is it used to be before Afghanistan, if you took a look at the website, uh, that listed all the, the bio, bios of every single officer in the Canadian Armed Forces who's a Army, Army or Air Force colonel or above or Navy captain or above, you can find out what their bio was. And they, many of them prominently listed uh, participation, leadership in the ice storm of 1998 and things like that. I wonder after two decades of, of Afghanistan and other more kinetic things, whether those operations are still proudly listed in the bi biographies of the officers. Alas, D&D and CAF have made that website unaccessible. Uh, so we can't really do the compare and contrast. That would be fun social science. Um, so we can't really see that. But my guess is that, yeah, they probably diminish the value of that or the importance of that. But I think that this experience of the past year may, may lead to some pushback because again, what affects more Canadians? running around in Latvia, Ukraine, or doing what they were doing in the past year in Canada. And it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's obvious that it's, it's domestic operations. And they're gonna have to say that, you know, okay, if domestic operations are gonna take more and more time, more and more money, then we're gonna have to reprioritize that. I means shifting resources, not just going, oh no, we're stretched, but actually putting the time and effort into re rejiggering things so that there's more, more troops available for this, that it's part of their natural battle rhythm, uh, that they, they know that they will be spending the spring dealing with flooding every year, but they, they do know that. But do they really plan for that? Do they really change the rest of their uh, training and recruiting and schedules for that? I'm not sure. Thanks very much. Uh, Professor Carvin has a question. I can't hear you. Push I'm the always the infrastructure prof that messes up. <laughs> always, every freaking time. Anyways, okay, doesn't matter. Podcasting, TV, same thing. Anyways, all that to say, first of all, I just want to give a shout out to my students, um, Annie and Raphael. They were, uh, you know, I asked uh, the group if they could present. They did so very willingly. We practiced all week and it really showed. So I'm just a proud master's mama right now, which is probably inappropriate, but I am. You guys did great. So Thank you. Uh, and thank you for representing the chapter in the book. My question to you guys um, is that, you know, I have a chapter in the book as well, and it kind of looks at how uh, operations were affected during COVID. But um, one of the things I took away from the interviews that I did was the fact that senior leadership in Canadian national security institutions is definitely looking to expand. 
uh, maybe they didn't expand because of surveillance, but because of, you know, they're, they're looking at what happened and they're realizing that, you know, maybe we have a bigger role to play here. Maybe we have more to offer. Maybe we need to do more horizon scanning in terms of our activities. So I was going to ask you the downside of that, but I think you've already maybe covered it. And so I was wondering, is there an upside to a larger national security presence in uh, the post-pandemic future, but I'll be happy to hear about your downsides as well. So I'll, I'll hear from uh, Jessica, then uh, Professor Zayman. Um, not really a, a, a supply chain question, but if you either of you have anything you want to add to, and I might jump in as well. Yeah, I think there are some upsides. I think you know, there's a natural space for a lot more information sharing here. Um, anything that can enhance our preparedness next time around, I think is the upside to any greater involvement of national security in the space. I think there are a lot of natural limits. You and I, Professor Carvin, have written about a lot of those natural limits um, and where they should be. So for me, the upsides are really about um, getting the in intelligence to the people who need it, but also maybe sharing some lessons learned about how to effectively brief warning problems. Um, and then just hopefully integrating health more into sort of that national security apparatus because it, it the pandemic may not be a national security problem, but it has national security implications to steal your own line from you. Professor Zayman. And I'm sorry, uh, Professor Carvin, can you tell me the question again? Kind of. <laughs> sorry, uh, just to address those two points. Okay, so um, first of all, with regards to supply chains, I guess my question would be, um, this question with regards to supply chains, is there an upside at looking at supply chains from a national security perspective? Uh, like what, what are the advantages of doing that? And uh, Steve, my question is really just, you know, we have, uh, you know, I, I did some interviews with national security agencies as a part of my chapter in the book, but uh, I guess what I'm wondering is if, if it, you know, you guys have, you've already addressed some of the downsides of this kind of wider role for national security agencies and, and the Department of Defense. Is, is there any upside here for a, a wider role in, for the, for say the Department of Defense in your case? Sure. I, I, as I suggested a little bit earlier, there's one of the things that civ, civil military relations scholars like to gnash their teeth about is that there are gaps between the civilians and the military. Um, the more we see the Canadian Armed Forces doing things that we can touch and feel and you know perceive, then that narrows the gap. So when you're you get your if you're going to a place and there are people in uniform who are helping you get your shots or you're seeing uh, folks in uniform going up to the north to help out. Uh, the First Nations, um, if when you see Major General Danny Fortin uh, at these briefings sound a lot sharper than most other people in the room, uh, particularly the premiers. Um, when you see, uh, you know, the, the pictures, uh, people will not forget the pictures of the, the, the calf going into a long-term care facility. So I, I think that all helps to create a, a little better understanding of what the calf can do. Um, and um, I think I think you might see, as I suggested earlier, that that the military may take these missions a little more seriously as part of their day job, as opposed to well, rather than just an inconvenience, which is sort of the way uh, Professor Le Leah West hinted in her question. Um, and and so I, th I think taking this seriously as as a major priority, uh, not just one thing on a list of four or five things, but maybe the second most important thing and the third most important thing rather than sort of an add-on. Um, again, the pace of operations in the, down the road with uh, more climate change disaster, induced uh, disasters, more pandemics. Uh, this is not gonna be uh, the last time the CAF does stuff domestically. So I think that uh, the pandemic will help them uh, maybe realign the priorities a little bit and it will also help bind the CAF to society a bit more clearly because it's, it's, it's a domestic security problem. And they're showing that they play a role in that. Um, we don't have a FEMA we have, you know, that the United States has. We have a CAF. And so I'm going to jump in on that as well and, and provide some upside. And I think um, 
I think it is about refocusing priorities and changing uh, the lens. And I think we've been overly focused in terms of um, cost to human life uh, and resources, that balance on terrorism um, and certain types of terrorism in the national security space in terms of what our, our broad government um, intelligence priorities are. And I think um, this will cause some of the intelligence priorities to shift in terms of aperture to public welfare um, causes of, of insecurity, um, human security issues. Um, and I think that that's appropriate, especially given what we expect to see um, with climate. And I think it'll help us uh, continue to look at, or I think it's allowed us to reshape our understanding of the, the real impacts of public welfare emergencies on national security in a way that without this kind of, of movement would have kept that kind of intelligence low on the priority list. Um, so that's my upside. Um, and in terms of infrastructure protection, um, do either one of you want to tackle Professor Carvin's question? Or sorry, supply chain. Um, I don't think I have anything to add to this question. No. Great. So we did get a question from uh, Deborah, um, and I might jump in on answering it first. Um, she said, generally speaking, what are your thoughts on the use of the Emergencies Act during the pandemic? Did the government go far enough in using the possible powers as an instrument to maintain national security and civil society? And this is certainly an area where um, the government could have the government could have used the Emergencies Act for supply chain management, certainly, um, and uh, also uh, in terms of the collection of information um, and security and surveillance potentially in, in more minute areas. Um, my uh, perspective was the Emergencies Act, the legal threshold to meet the, the Emergencies Act has long been there. The legal threshold for the Emergencies Act is an emergency that's beyond the capacity of a province to deal with that has an impact, um, you know, a, a national impact that can't be addressed, addressed by any other act of parliament, meaning, sorry, any other act of Canada, meaning any other federal act. So did we have any other legislative tools to do the things that you need to do to respond to COVID? What the government chose to do was create new legislation. It, it offset, you know, and I think this is largely to do with the fact that the biggest issues to deal with are those things that are managed largely at the provincial level. So manufacturing, you know, that is provincial jurisdiction, uh, health provincial jurisdiction. So if we look at the role of the federal government, what is the federal government to do here? In this case, right? what they needed to do was provide money, right? Um, to people largely um, and had certain provinces not responded appropriately within their jurisdiction, right? Had not responded. If we'd had a South Dakota type response, for example, where one of the premiers chose to not respond and in order to manage it, the federal government needed to seize control. That would have been something that would have been appropriate for using the Emergencies Act for um, within and, and seize jurisdiction. But the provinces didn't respond inappropriately at first. They largely took control over the issue. Um, they didn't need the federal government to mandate them to do certain things. Um, and so unless we get into a situation where provinces aren't doing things or things need to be federalized that fall within that provincial jurisdiction, like supply chain management, for example, um, or vaccine distribution, which is largely being managed to an extent right now at the federal level and then down to the provinces, then that would have been a useful use for the emergencies. Act. But otherwise, what do we need, right? What do we need them to do? Um, and, and I don't have a good answer for that. Um, some people would have said, you know, uh, increased bans on travel. Well, that's done through the quarantine act, right? So I don't, I don't know that what they would have needed to do unless a province or provinces chose not to respond using their own provincial authorities. So, but I'll leave it to others to answer as well. Anyone else wanna jump in? I'm not a legal beagle, so I can't <laughs> the legalities of this. I think one of the challenges that this pandemic has revealed 
has reminded us again is that federalism is both boon and bane. So this, this disease revealed the strengths and weaknesses of federalism. So when the federal government is doing things poorly and, the, and a province is doing well, then the province can do things well. Like we saw the Atlantic bubble work out really well. And that was something that they worked out together. And that was better in some ways than whatever the, the, poly, the stances the federal government was taking. On the other hand, when federal when provinces are screwing things up, and they've been screwing things up in a big way in Alberta, uh, Quebec, and Ontario, uh, other places too potentially. But those are the three big three that seem to be making the most of the news for messing us up. Um, it's hard, you know. We 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 would like to have the federal government tell them what to do, but because there's only 11, you know, 10 or so provinces, these negotiations are always hard. Federalism is very contested here. You just can't, you don't have the same kind of authorities just to, to do stuff. The United States, the United States government can say Inter interstate commerce act that this is traveling across borders. So it's a federal thing, shut up states. Uh, and no state proposes the same kind of leverage in American politics, the way Quebec or Ontario or Alberta does in Canadian politics. So it's, it's just really hard to do so. So Trudeau has been reluctant to step on their toes. He could have done some things early on. And part of it is these did she give money to the provinces and then they chose not to spend some of it. Like Doug Ford spend, chose not to spend as much money on preparing the schools this past fall. That was his choice. He had the money to do it, but he didn't. So can the Emergency Act force a premier to do what is the right thing? Oh, Maybe-ish, but not really. And it's, it's not really what the act is for. Um, so in this case, I would say that that you know, when it, it reminds me of um, what has become a, a common phrase in American politics, which is Green Lantern theory. Green Lantern is a superhero whose magic ring allows him to change reality by wishing it to be so as long, creating a green thing of any kind, of any shape. And so what we see increasingly by the media in both the United States and Canada is Green Lantern theory. Oh, the leader can just do it. They just can wish it into being. And the answer is no, that's not the case. I'll just add that Early on, um, when there were calls um, from public figures to invoke the Emergencies Act, saying, why haven't you done it? Why haven't you done it? And a lot of, there was a lot of theorizing that it was because of the political history of the War Measures Act and yada, yada, yada. Although the two acts are very, 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 very different. Um, I will say that if you look to a large number of those people who were calling for the Emergencies Act to be employed, it was former military generals. Um, <laughs> And, and I think because there was some belief that the feds can do it better. Um, but I think, it, and, 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 and I think realistically, when we're talking about a disease that really impacts municipality by municipality differently, right? The Emergencies Act is a very, very blunt tool Right, you don't want to take the the power out of the hands of the provinces and the municipalities, um, nor the responsibility um, from the provinces and municipalities by invoking the Emergencies Act uh, when it's not necessary. And like I said, the Emergencies Act, you know, public welfare emergencies is just one, but it can be invoked for war or insurrection. Um, where you might see a real need um, for, and that's when it was invoked in the past. Um, but public welfare emergency, unless the provinces are not responding, I don't see that going to be the first time we see it see it used in this country anyway, and, and partially because of um, what Professor Sadman just had to say. Um, so we have a question from um, our students. Um, how should Canada attract medical device manufacturers to establish a sort, shorter supply chain in the local economy? And what would be some supporting or blocking forces to this movement towards shorter supply chains? We can see it is it essentially a manufacturing industry to supply our own healthcare system. How would, um, so, you know, how would we do that? How would we incentivize that? How do we establish shorter supply chain? Um, first, thanks a lot for this question. Um, could you repeat the first uh, part, the first portion of the question? How should Canada attract medical device manufacturers to establish a shorter supply chain in the local economy? Um, I think that when uh, medical device manufacturer consider Canada as a place where they can establish, they have pros. There's a highly educated workforce and I could go on and on for all the pros, but there are also cons such as a low domestic, uh, small domestic market. Therefore, uh, 
any manufacturer, any manufacturing operation considering to establish in Canada will also have to consider, we will have to export to Europe, to the US, to there and a bunch of places. But sometimes we make it harder to export from here than some other countries who have facilitated a program. So uh, it's something that I know for a fact that could help. Uh, Many foreign companies will consider to establish themselves in Canada if, if we remove certain barriers or if we help uh, exports. And, and if we uh, help them to establish here, uh, of course, they will increase their link to many distribution partners and therefore help to short term uh, the supply chain gaps. I don't know if this uh, answers the question. Oh, I think that's pretty, uh, pretty clear. Thanks, Rafael. All right, well, I don't see any more questions in the chat and uh, I'm tired of hearing my voice. So I'm going to uh, thank you all very much for attending on a Friday for so many of you sticking all the way to the end. Um, and I do hope that when uh, the book comes out, everyone takes the opportunity to read it and provide feedback. Um, we really, again, thank our funders, Shirk and Minds and uh, the faculty uh, Public Affairs at NIPSIA for hosting us today. So thank you to everyone for attending and thank you to all of our panelists and have a great weekend.